Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're having a CUBE conversation in our Palo Alto studio. The conference season hasn't got to full swing yet, so we can have a little bit more relaxed atmosphere here in the studio. And we're really excited as part of our continuing coverage for the Data Makes Possible, sponsored by Western Digital, looking at cool applications, you know, really the impact of, of of data and analytics, ultimately it gets stored usually on a Western digital hard drive someplace. And this is a great segment. Who doesn't like talking about sports and football and advanced analytics? And we're really excited to have John Pollard here. He is the VP of Business Development for Zebra Sports. John, great to see you. Jeff, thanks for having me. Absolutely, so before we jump into the fun stuff, just a little bit of background on, on uh, Zebra Sports and Zebra Technologies. Okay, well first, Zebra Technologies is a publicly traded company. We started in the late 1960s, and really what we do is we track uh, enterprise assets in industries typically like healthcare, retail, travel and logistics, um, and transportation. And what we've done is take that heritage and bring that over into the world of sports starting four years ago with our relationship with the NFL as the official player tracking technology. It's such a great story of an old line company, right, based in, in, in Illinois, Lincoln, yeah, outside Lincoln of Chicago, right, yep. to RFID tags and inventory management and all this kind of you know old school right. stuff, but then to take that into this really dynamic world, A, of sports, but even more advanced analytics, which is relatively new. We've been at it for a few years, but what a great move by the company to go into this space. How do they choose to do that? Well, it was an opportunity that just came to them through an RFP. Uh, the NFL had investigated different technologies to track players including optical and GPS-based technologies, and now, of course, with Zebra, our location and uh, technologies are based on RFID. Um, and so we just took the heritage and our capabilities of really working at the edge of enterprises in those traditional industries, from transactional moments to inventory control moments to analytics at the end, and took that model and ported it over to football. And it's turned out to be a very good relationship for us in, in a couple of ways. We've matured as a sports business over the four years. We've uh, developed more opportunities to take our solutions, not just in-game, but moving them into the practice facilities for NFL teams. But it's also opened up the aperture for other industries to now appreciate how we can track minute types of information like players moving around on right, the football field right. and translating it into usable information. So for the people that aren't familiar, they can do a little homework, but basically you have a, a little tag, a little sensor that goes onto the shoulder pads, right? There's two chips. Two chips, yes. and from that you can tell where that player is all the time and how they move, how fast they move, acceleration, all that type of stuff, right? Correct, we put two chips inside of the shoulder pads for down linemen or people who play with their hands on the ground, we put a third chip between the shoulder blades. Those chips communicate with receiver boxes that have been installed across the perimeter or around the perimeter of a stadium and they blink 12 times per second. And that does tell you who's on the field, where they are on the field, and in proximity to other players on the field. And once the play starts itself, we can see how fast they're going, we can calculate change of direction, acceleration, deceleration metrics. And we also can see, as you know, with football, inf interesting information like separation from a wide receiver and defensive back, right. which is critical when you're evaluating players' capabilities. So this started about four years ago, right? Yes, we started our relationship with the league in-game four years ago. Okay, so I'd just love to kind of hear your take on how how the evolution of the introduction of this data was received by the league, received by the teams, um, something they'd never had before, right? Kind of a look and feel, and you can look at film, but yeah. not to the degree and, and, and the tightness of tolerances that you guys are able to deliver. Well, like any new technology and information resource, it takes time to, right. you know, first of all, determine what you want to do with that information. You have an, an idea when you start, and then it evolves over time. And so what we started with was tagging the players themselves, and, and during the time, we, what we really enjoyed in working with the NFL is that the league has to be very pragmatic and thoughtful when introducing new technologies and information. So they studied and researched the information to determine how, do they, how much of this information do they share with the clubs, how much do they share with the fans and the media, um, and then what type of information sharing, what, what does that mean in terms of impact of the integrity of the game and fair competition? And so for the first two years, it was more of a research and testing type of process. And starting in 2016, you started to see more of an acceleration of that data being shared with the clubs. Each club would receive their own data for in-game. And then we would start to see some of that trickle out through the NFL's Next Gen Stats brand uh, banner on their NFL.com site. Right. Um, and so then we start to see more of that. And then what I really think we've seen pick up pace, certainly in 2017, is more utilization of this information 
from a media perspective. We're seeing them more in, in, uh, integrated into the broadcast themselves, so you have a kind of a live tracking set of information that keeps you, you know, contextually involved in the game. Right, and you, you were involved in advanced analytics before you joined Zebra, so you've been kind of in this advanced stats world for a while. So how did it how did it change when you actually had a real-time sensor on people's bodies? Yeah, it does feel a bit like Groundhog Day. I, <laughs> I, start, I started more in the stats and advanced analytics right, uh, when right. I worked for Stats LLC. In 2007, I uh, developed a piece of software for the New Orleans Saints that they used to track observational statistics to game video. And it was a similar type of experience in starting in 2009 and introducing that to teams where it took about three or four years where teams started to feel like that new information resource was not a, a nice to have, but a need to have, a premium right. ingredient that they could use for game planning um, and then player evaluation and also the technology could provide them some efficiencies. We're seeing that now with the tracking data. We just returned from the NFL Combine a couple of weeks ago. And what, what I felt in all of the conversations that we had with clubs was that there was a high level of appreciation and a lot of interest and how tracking data can help facilitate their traditional scouting and player evaluation processes. The technology itself, how can it make the teams more efficient in evaluating players and developing game plans? So there's a lot of excitement. We've kind of hit that tipping point, if I may, right, right. where there's general acceptance and excitement about the data, and then it's incumbent upon us as a partner uh, with the league and with the teams where, for our practice clients to teach them how to use the analytics uh, and statistics effectively. So I'm just curious, some of the specific data points that you've seen evolve over time, and also the uses. I think you're talking about a little bit uh, off camera that or originally it was really more the training staff, and it was really more kind of the health of the player. Right. Then I, I would imagine it evolved to, you know, now you can actually see what's going on in terms of better analysis, but I would imagine that it's, is it going to evolve where coaches are getting that feedback in real time on a per play basis and are making, you know, in-game adjustments based on this real-time data? Well, technically that's feasible today, but then there's the rules of engagement with the league itself, and so the, the teams themselves and the coaches on the sideline aren't seeing this tracking data live, whether it be in the booth or on the sidelines. Now, in a practice environment, that's what teams are using our system for. With inside of three seconds, they're seeing real-time information show up about practice, players during practice. Let's take an example, a, a player during practice who's coming back from injury. You might want to monitor their output uh, during the week as they come back and then make sure that they're ready for the game on a week-to-week -week basis. Trainers are now able to see that information and take that over to a position coach or a head coach and make them aware of the performance of the player during practice. And you know, I think sometimes people think with tracking data, it's all about managing the health of the player and making sure they don't overwork. Right. Well, really, there's an, the antithesis of that is you can actually also identify players who aren't necessarily reaching their maximum output for that will help them build throughout the week from peak performance during a game. And so a lot of teams like to say, okay, I have a wide receiver, I know their max miles per hour is, let's use an example, 20.5 20 20 miles an hour. He hasn't hit his max yet during the entire week, so let's get him into some drills and some sessions where he can start hitting that max so that we reduce the potential for injury on game day. Right, another area that, that probably a lot of people would never think is you also put sensors on the refs. Right. Um, so you know not only where the refs are, but are they in the right positions technically and, 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 and kind of from a best practices to make the calls for the, for the areas that they're trying to cover. Right. So it's got to be, was there a union pushback on this type of stuff? I mean, there's got to be some interesting, you know, kind of dynamics going on. Yeah, as far as the referees, I know that referees are tagged and the NFL uses that information and correlates that with the play calls themselves. We're not involved in that process, but I, I know they're utilizing the information. Um, in addition to the referees, I should add, we also have a tag in the ball itself. That's right. um, 2017 season was the first year that we had every single game had a, a tagged ball. Now that tagged information in the ball was not shared with the clubs yet. The, the uh, league is still researching the information like they did with the player stuff. Right, After right. a couple of years of research, then they decide to distribute that to the teams and the media. So we are tracking a lot of assets. We also have tags in the first down markers and the pylons. And I'll just you know cut to the chase there. People will say, okay, does that mean you can use these chips and this technology to identify first down marks or when a, a ball might break the plane for a potential touchdown? Technically, you can do that, and that's something that the league may be researching, but right now, that's not part of our charter with them. Right, so I'm just curious about the conversations about the data and the use of the data, because mm -hmm. as you said, there's a lot of raw data, mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's, there's kind of governance issues and, and, and rules of engagement, and then there's also, you know, what types of analytics get, a, get a applied on top of that data, and then of course also, it's about context. What's the context of the analytics? So I wonder if you could speak to the kind of the evolution of that process, you know, what were people looking at when you first introduced this four years ago, and how has it moved over time in terms of adding new analytics on top of that data set? That's one of my favorite topics to talk about. When we first started uh, with the league and engaging teams for the practice solution, 
solution uh, or providing them analytics, they in essence got a large raw data file <laughs> of XY <laughs> coordinates. <CSV. laughs> Here's a gigantic Even hard better, drive and, and put it into a spreadsheet <laughs> and go. Um, there was some of that early on and, and really what we had to do through the power of software is develop an application platform that would help teams manage and organize this data appropriately develop the appropriate reports or interesting reports and analysis. And over the last two or three years, I think we've really found our stride at Zebra in providing solutions to go along with the you know, uh, capabilities of the technology itself. Right. Um, so you know, at first it was strength and conditioning coaches plowing through this information in great detail or, or analytics staffs. And what we've seen over the last 24 months is director of analytics now, personnel staff, coaches as well, a broadening group of people inside of a football organization start to use this data because the software itself allows them to do so. I'll give an example. In, instead of just tabular information and charts and graphs, we now take the data and we can plot them into a play field schematic, which as you know, as we talked off camera, you're very familiar with football. That just automates the process of a team, what teams do today manually is right. develop play right. cards so they can do self-study and advanced scouting techniques. Right. Uh, that's all automated today. And not only that, it's animated because because we have the tracking information and we can merge that to game video. So we're just trying to make our, the tools with the software uh, you know, more functional so everybody in the organization can utilize it beyond strength and conditioning, which is important, right, right. but now we're broadening the aperture and appealing to everybody in the organization. Do you do play, I can just see you can do play development too. If you, put, if you plug in everybody's speeds and feeds, you have a certain duration of time, you, could, you can probably A, B, test all types of routes and timing on drops and now you know how Help how hard the, the guy throws the ball to come up with a pretty wide array of options, I would imagine, within it, it, the time window. Exactly. A couple of examples I could give, you know, when we meet with teams, we have every player, uh, let's say, I'll just uh, on a team, and we know all the routes they ran during an entire season. So you can imagine on a visualization tool, you can imagine it looks like a spaghetti chart of different routes, and then right. you start scenario, breaking down the scenarios, the context, as we talked about earlier, it's third down, it's in the red zone, it's receptions, and so that becomes you know, a smaller set of lines that you see on the right. chart. Right. I'll tell you, Jeff, when we start meeting with teams at the combine and we start showing them their, their X or primary receiver or their slot receiver tendencies visually, their eye, they start leading forward, they, oh my goodness, we, we, we spend way too much time on the same route when we're targeting you know, for right. touchdown passes, or we're right-handed too much, we have to change that up. That's the most gratifying thing, is that you're taking a picture and you're really illuminating in those coaches who intrinsically know that, but once they see a visual cue, it, it validates something in their head that either have to change or evolve something in their game plan or, or, you know, or their practice regimen. Well, that's what I was going to ask, and you led right into it, is you know, what are some of the things that get the old school person or the people that just don't get, the, they don't get it, they don't have the time, they don't believe it, or maybe they believe it, but they don't have the time, they're, they're afraid or understand. Sure. You know, what are some of those kind of light bulb moments when they go, okay, you know, I get it, as you said, most of the time if they're smart, it's going to be kind of a validation of something that they've already felt, but right. they've never actually had the data in front of them. Right, that's, that's exactly right. So that, the first thing is just quantifying, providing a quantifiable, you know, empirical set of evidence to support what they intrinsically know as professional evaluators or coaches. Right, right. So we always say that the data itself and the technology isn't meant to be a silver bullet. It's now a new premium ingredient that can help support the processes that have existed in the past and hopefully provide some efficiency. Right. And so that's the first thing. I, I think the visual, the example I showed about the wide receiver tendencies when they're thrown to in the red zone, that, that always gets people leaning forward a little bit. Also with running backs, third down in three plus yards or th third down in short situations, am I right-handed or left-handed when I'm on a certain hash? Again, the visualization just allows them to really you know, mark phase. something in their head where it makes them, makes them you know, really understand. Another example that's interesting is um, players who play on special teams uh, who are also wide receivers. So as we know, you know linebackers and, you know, and tight ends tend to be high, and cornerbacks tend to be involved in special teams. Well, is there an effect when they've covered kickoffs and punts, a, a, a large amount of those in a game, is that an effect, did it affect them on side of ball play, right. for instance? Right. Uh, think about Julian Edelman two Super Bowls ago. He played 93 snaps against the Atlanta Falcons. And when you look at the route. Played 93 played, snaps. Yeah, between special, because it went into overtime, right? Right, right. And right. it was a lot of offensive game, the, uh, played a lot of snaps, played 93 snaps. How does that affect 
his route integrity. Not only the types and quality of the route, but the depth and speed he gets to those points. Those right. change over time. Right, right. So this type of information can give the experts just a little bit more information to find that edge. Right. And I have a great mentor of mine, I have to bring him up, Gil Brandt, you know, former VP of personnel of the Dallas Cowboys right. with Texram and Tom Landry. He looks at this type of information and he says, what would a team pay for for one more victory? Right. So, you know, as we know, all coaches and professional organizations and college are looking for an edge. And if we can provide that with our technology through efficiencies and some type of support information resource, then we're doing our job. I just want to get, before I let you go, just the, the human factors on that. I mean, football coaches are notoriously crazy workers and right, you can always watch more films. So now you're adding a whole new category of data and information. How is that being received on, on their side? Is it, are they going to have to put new staff and resources against this? I mean, there's only, there's only so many right. hours in a day and I can't help but think of the, you know, the, the, the second tier, third tier coaches who are going to be on the hook for going through this. Or can you automate so much of it so it's not necessarily this additional burden that they have to, to take on? Because I would imagine, you know, if the Cowboys are doing it, the Eagles got to do it, the Giants got to do it, and the Washington Redskins got to right. do it, right? Right. Well, each team, as you might expect, their cultures are different. Um, and I would say two or three years ago, you started to see more teams hire literally by title, director of analytics or right. director of football information, instead of sharing that, resp that responsibility between two or three people that already existed in the organization. So that staffing, I think, occurred a couple of, two or three years ago, or over the last two or three years. Okay. This becomes another element for those staffs to work with. But also along, along that process over the last two or three years is, Really, I always try to say in talking to teams, and I'll be on the road again here soon, talking to clubs after pro days conclude, is we, are you do, forget about stats and analytics and that idea. Do you want to be information driven? And do right. you want to be efficient? Right. And that's something that everybody can grasp onto, whether you're the strength and conditioning coach, a personnel staff or scout, or a, co or, or a position coach, or a head coach, or a coordinator. So we try to be information driven, and then that seems to ease the process of people thinking, I have to hire more people. Right, what I really right. need to do is ask my people that are already in place to be, be more curious about this information, and if we're going to invest in a resource that can help support them and make them more efficient, make sure we leverage it. And so right. that's our process that we work with. It varies by team. Some teams have large, large, expansive staffs. That doesn't necessarily mean, in my opinion, the most effective staffs using information. Right, right. Sometimes it's the, it's the organizations that run very lean, with a few set of people, but very focused and moving in one direction. I love it, data for efficiency, right? And, right. and God, we trust everybody else bring data. One yeah. of my, one of my favorite <laughs> lines that we hear over and over and over I'll, these I'm shows. I, in fact, I might borrow that you next could, week. You could yeah. take that <laughs> Thank one. You, All Jeff. right, well, John, thanks for, for taking a few minutes and stopping by and, and, and participating in this Western Digital program, because it is all about the data and it is about efficiency, so it's not necessarily trying to kill people with more tools, but help them be better. That's all we're trying to do. I appreciate the opportunity and love to talk to you more. Absolutely, well, okay. hopefully we'll see you again. He's all John right. Pollard, I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching theCUBE from Palo Alto Studios, thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.